It's Tuesday, the 20th of April. Welcome to The Breakfast Show. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. I apologise if I look a little bit orange today, but the sun is shining through the blinds right in front of me. Uh, we will get to those news headlines in just a second. But first, we have to take care of those all-important celebrity birthdays. Now, I'm going to gloss over the fact that today marks the birthday of Adolf Hitler and focus instead on saying happy birthday to Star Trek's very own Mr. Sulu, uh, actor George Takai. It's also happy birthday to uh, Nicholas Lindhurst, who played Rodney in Only Fools and Horses. So happy birthday, Dave. Uh, I'd also like to make a, a, a very quick mention of the fact that the undercarriage part supplier MST is celebrating their 50th anniversary. So happy birthday or happy anniversary to those guys as well. We'll be right back after this. If you enjoyed this show, please consider supporting us. Go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash demolition news. Now, just as I was about to go and press the uh, go live button this morning, I received details from the health and safety executive of a prosecution against Preston-based Bradley Demolition. Uh, it relates to an incident in which um, an operator um, of a MUP, a, an access platform, was was uh, uh, suffering life-changing in injuries. Uh, I only just had time to post details of that statement over on demolitionnews.com, so you can read it there, but I haven't really had time to do any real homework or to digest the details, so we'll probably revisit that one tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, an historic Northumberland mansion is set to be demolished. Uh, Carham Hall, five miles from Coldstream, uh, right up in the borders, uh, occupies the site of a 15th century tower uh, built to defend the uh, against the border uh, the border ravers or rivers. Not even sure who they are. Um, the property was converted into a mansion house in the mid 18th century before being redeveloped in 1870 into a neo Tudor style. Most recently, a care home, Carham Hall, is now set to be demolished in September, with plans having been lodged with Northumberland County Council. However, local planning authorities and uh, I pressed the wrong button, bear with me one second. That's better, yeah. However, local planning authorities and demolition contractors will need to act very, very quickly. Uh, the building isn't currently listed, uh, meaning its history and heritage could be lost forever. But a spokesman for uh, Historic England said that Carham Hall is currently being considered for listing, and that listing could yet save the mansion from demolition. <laughs> Now, word reaches us from market intelligence provider, the Builders Conference, that a budget of £6.3 million has been set aside for the construction of a new industrial unit at Greenland Road in Sheffield. But first, a former B&Q outlet needs to be demolished and altered. And as yet, no demolition contractor has been appointed. You can find out more about this project lead and many more besides over at, dem uh, over at buildersconference.co.uk. Uh, if you want a regular supply of project leads, I strongly recommend that you take a look. Oh, and by the way, the Builders Conference also tell us that Stockport-based Glen Barrow Demolition has been selected to carry out the demolition of a mosque on Wilmslow Road in Cheadle. So congratulations to the team at Glen Barrow. Now, if you've spent any time on this channel, you'll know that Peter Haddock of Content With Media is an almost constant presence. Uh, he's a co-founder of uh, the Construction Collective and a regular contributor on both Demolition News and Diggers and Dozers. Uh, I make no secret of the fact I like Peter. I like his enthusiasm and his passion for the industry. I appreciate his insight and his eagerness. So I was already a fully paid up member of the Peter Haddock fan club, even before yesterday's new podcast episode dropped. But even if I wasn't, I would be now. Uh, I won't give away any spoilers. You, you, you need to listen to this one for yourself. But this episode goes above and beyond journalism and content creation. This is activism in the most positive sense of the word. It's standing up and being counted. Peter covers a previously taboo subject without being remotely preachy or patronising. And perhaps more importantly, his guest is outstanding, brave and forthright. So please find the time to give this one a listen. Uh, I have placed a, a link to the in the description of today's show. I'll add it again in the extended show notes. But this is a pioneering piece of industry broadcasting. So please try to find the time to give this one a listen. Now, as a journalist, my primary interest is in the what is. But just occasionally, I like to consider what if. 
So when news broke uh, this weekend of a breakaway European Football League that would see some of the biggest and richest clubs in the continent going it alone, my brain started to wonder, what if the same thing happened right here in the field of demolition? Now, I wrote about this yesterday, and you can find that article over on demolitionnews.com, and I'm not going to rehash that article here. Instead, I want to look at why such a move could make sense, and and having been prompted to do so on Instagram, I also wanted to consider just which companies would merit inclusion in a European uh, demolition super league. So from here on in, I'm off script, I'm freewheeling and ad-libbing, trying to make a, a valid point and trying to make sense at the same time. So let's start with why a demolition Super League would actually make sense. Let's get this uh, the right banner up. There we go. <clears throat> if you think about the, the makeup of, let's say, the National Federation of Demolition Contractors, the NFDC, so it's got 140, 145 odd members. Of those, there's probably a dozen or so that are multi million pound blue chip demolition companies but the vast majority are considerably smaller so the nfdc is not exactly representative of of both ends of the spectrum and if you think about it a company like erith one of the you know the the biggest and and probably one of the best demolition companies in in the uk has got more in common with a company like despe um, their opposite number over in italy than they have with a small demolition company right here in the uk going back to the nfdc I, I think everyone will agree that the the nfdc is is largely influenced by the presence of those big hitters you know the the Eris, the Kelpreys, the McGees, the Squib Groups, the DSMs, all of these companies have a major influence on the NFDC and the way it runs, and also on the National Demolition Training Group. And that's not necessarily to the benefit of those smaller companies. I've always had a concern about training policy anyway, in the fact that it's driven by companies um, that are big enough and financially sound enough to accommodate any change that that anyone cares to make to the training regime a lot of demolition companies at the smaller end can't afford constant price rises and constant car renewals and and just having new rules and regulations foist upon them at the the will of of somebody with considerably more money in the pot also i think if you take out the big names of the industry from these national organizations um, and this is not this is not singling out the NFDC. I'm sure I'm sure the same situation exists in France, Germany, Italy, and all these places. But if you take those big names out of the out of the national organisations, those organisations then become more democratic and more representative of the true nature of the the business. As I said, very few demolition firms turn over twenty million, thirty, fifty million, a hundred million pounds. So let's let's assume, and it is a big assumption, but let's assume we are going to start a European Demolition Super League. Now, I, I did try to follow the rules that are being set by um, the Football Super League, uh, having six representatives from the UK, three from uh, Italy, and three from Spain. But I don't think that's fair. So I'm going to I'm going to make my list just a little bit different to that. And my incomplete list, I would start with the following. Erith definitely going in. Um, they are massive, um, very, very good company. They, they are probably as close to a blue chip company as the UK demolition industry has, uh, I would say. DSM. DSM, equally massive, um, and, and, and again, a, a fantastic company. And Brown and Mason. Uh, Brown and Mason, prime. You know, another very big, another a very professional company, but also I believe that their um, power station demolition expertise is transferable and exportable. So you know, they they could quite easily, and they, you know, they could quite easily work cross border, and they have done in the past. So I think that one would, would make perfect sense. You'll note that I've not included Kelpray or Carey Group, even though they are both undeniably massive. But neither of them is what I would call a pure demolition company. And while some are willing to overlook that fact, this is my imaginary Super League, so 
I set the rules. So Kelp Bray and uh, Carey Group don't qualify. From Italy, no question about it, Despe. Um, Despe is as good, if not better, than any demolition company in the entire world. They are the Juventus of demolition. Um, AF Decom of Norway gets a nod. Like Brown and Mason, they've got a unique set of skills, transferable skills, um, and they could operate very, very happily cross-continent without a moment's consideration. Uh, other companies that have impressed me over the years, um, Balen in the Netherlands, very impressive company. Cardem in France and Herkel in Spain. Um, I'm sure there are others that, that I haven't considered. Um, I don't know the German market as well as, as perhaps I might, although, you know, again, reflecting the European Super League in football, the Germans have opted out anyway. So, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to worry about that one quite so much. Will a demolition Super League ever exist? I doubt it. I, I very much doubt it. There's too much vested interest at national level. But I can't help thinking that this would kill so many birds with a single stone. Like Build UK here in the UK, it would group together, together the industry elite. They could have their own little club while the other parts of the Danish industry have their own little clubs. That, 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 to me, makes perfect sense. I think it would make national organisations like the NFDC here in the UK, like the German associations, the French and the, the Dutch and all those, I think it would make them more representative and more democratic. Uh, I think it would also give others a turn at the top table of the industry. Uh, I mentioned in my article, again, over in, on demolitionnews.com, the fact that if uh, Manchester United and Manchester City and Liverpool, Arsenal and Tottenham all do jump ship and and bugger off, basically. Uh, my team, West Ham, basically become, if not the best, the second best team in the country. I could live with that. I, you know, I don't have a major problem with that at all. And I do think sharing around um, influence would would potentially benefit. Um, it might also do away with this notion of um, the big companies influencing the industry to the degree that they do. Um, and, and bear in mind, as I've said before, this is an industry that is made up almost entirely of smaller companies, small family-owned companies. It's not really a big company business. Um, so giving those smaller smaller firms much like giving more of a say to West Ham and Leicester in, in football. I think there is a lot to be said for that. There is, of course, here in the UK, the elephant in the room. Um, one of the first phone calls I got um, when I mentioned the fact or the, the proposed the notion of a European Super League was the fact that some companies um, that are thought to be under investigation as part of the Companies and Markets Authority investigation into alleged collusion in the demolition industry could find themselves outside of the national the existing national organizations anyway so if they still want to belong to a club um, and if they are they either quit the nfdc or they are ejected from the nfdc whatever the case may be maybe they will need a club of their own maybe they will start a club of their own and maybe just maybe that club could go cross border um I don't know. I can't see it. As I say, I think there's too much vested interest. Um, I think language barrier would be an issue. And I, I'm saying all of this in, in the knowledge that there is a European Demolition Association. But the European Demolition Association, for all its, its very good work, and it does do some good work, um, particularly in its lobbying of the European Parliament, um, I do wonder, again, I mean, that, that tends to be made up of companies that are uh, members of national organisations. So you find that EDA members are generally NFDC members here in the UK and they're members of German, Dutch and uh, Italian federations as well. So you, you've effectively got a, a mirroring of that that membership, I guess. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe something over and above the EDA, you know, this, this demolition Super League. Maybe it makes sense. I don't know. I'm just rambling here. Um, be interested to see what you think. Um, you can add comments in uh, the comment section below. Um, we, uh, But until tomorrow, I'm going to go away and mull this one over a little bit more. I'm also going to go and have another look at the accident involving uh, Bradley demolition. I mean, the accident itself apparently happened about three years ago, uh, possibly even more than that. Um, and once again, the HSE have taken forever to bring it to uh, prosecution. Um, but it will be an interesting one. And one of the things I, I want to consider with that 
is the fact that I, I've reported quite a lot recently on the fact that the International Powered Access Federation, or IPAF, is very, very quick to take on board details of accidents and near misses and to have that steer and influence training that is delivered almost instantly. I mean, they, they are taking near misses and they are using that to steer guidance and, and training. The irony with this is the fact that, as it stands at the moment, an, an accident that has happened here in demolition, admittedly involving a, 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 an access platform, an accident that's happened here in demolition could influence training in the access platform industry. But because we are still not willing or able or both to have our own near miss register here in demolition, it's unlikely to do so here. The irony. Um, that will do me for today. I, I can sense I'm rambling. Um, I'm going to get on with my day. Uh, I'll be back here again at 10 a.m. on the morrow. Um, but until then, have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine, which is still pouring through my blinds. Um, and I will see you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching.